This is what it looks like when you try to house 900,000 people on 1,200 hectares of land. This is a Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh. Ahead, I'm going to show you the disturbing story of how the Rohingya people are desperately trying to survive, and you will see the people from all over the world who are desperately trying to help them. Hello, welcome to Plugged In. Today, we examine a world crisis, migration, refugees, and the challenges ahead as more and more people are on the move, some running for their lives. In 2017, 258 million people were living somewhere other than the country where they were born. And according to the United Nations, that 258 million is more than 3% of the planet's population. Humans have always migrated, some for opportunity and some to save their lives. Since August 2017, more than 700,000 Rohingya fled what the United States and the United Nations have identified as ethnic cleansing by the Myanmar military. They fled from Myanmar's Rakhine state to the relative safety of Bangladesh, where refugee camps were already populated with about 200,000 Rohingya who fled earlier attacks. Now, more than 900,000 Rohingya are in those overcrowded refugee camps with little hope for change anytime soon. I went to Cox Bazaar in June for Voice of America. It was my second trip in six months to the Rohingya refugee camps to see what's being done to help these people survive. You know, I've heard people say that it's gotten better. I didn't think it had gotten better because you've had more people who have descended upon this area, run out of Myanmar by the Myanmar military, ethnic cleansing, and so it seems more crowded as they try to expand these camps. And this is, this is just the beginning, and I honestly don't know how these Rohingya are going to endure this day after day after day. Actually, it's, it's hour after hour after hour. There's another crisis, danger, and this is, you know, this is just unthinkable. Absolutely unthinkable that anyone could suffer like this. And a million people are all penned in their suffering. But what was even worse this time than when I was there six months ago is the monsoon season had set in. And you've got all these people, almost a million people, who descended upon this area fleeing for their lives, and they took down all the vegetation to build shelters and also to use as fuel to cook. So there's nothing, there, there are no trees or anything to hold the soil. And they came in, and in desperation, they built these shelters wherever they could first see them, and they built them on hillsides. Well, now comes the monsoon season. And the monsoon season, unless you've been in a monsoon, it's, I mean, you see, never see anything like it. So now what's happening is these shelters are literally collapsing on the shelters beneath them. Then you've got the added problem that they are also, there were some latrines that were built um, on, on the hillside too. That likewise, those are now collapsing and they're draining and the filth, the filthy water and the feces in the water is flowing down into the water system. And you know that that's a fertile breeding ground for disease. That's how cholera is uh, transmitted is in filthy water. Everyone seems somewhat uh, jubilant by the fact that half the people in the camp, they've been able to vaccinate for cholera, but half is half a million people, and you've got another 480,000 people who haven't been. And as we got deeper into the into the camp, we were on a road that got washed away uh, while we were inside the camp by the monsoon. Let's take a look. I mean, it's unbelievable. This is what they're now going to drive across. Right here, take a look at this, and it uh, and it's straight down, what, about 50 or 60 feet? Straight down. While the roads are impassable and even dangerous, how do you get food in there? What if someone gets sick? And these people are living on top of each other. Well, the one thing that's the sort of redeeming quality about this is that, you know, just like we saw with the, with the boys in the cave in Thailand, there are a lot of really good people out there in the world and from all over the world. And to deal with the health crisis, you've got a lot of NGOs that have, that have come to um, Bangladesh to help out. So there's, there's been an, an, an overpouring of help from the world, but not a, you can't meet the magnitude of the challenge. That's the problem. So the good side is you see these incredible people working around the clock 24-7. By the other hand, is that you look around and you see that uh, there are almost a million people here and it's just not being handled completely. There's not enough of a world spotlight on this crisis. The one thing that would give me hope is if there were a greater commitment to use the giant spotlight of the world media on this crisis, because this is ethnic cleansing. And the world sort of collectively said, never again after the Holocaust, and said, never again after Rwanda. Well, it's happening again. The UN has called this ethnic cleansing. Uh, the United States has called this ethnic cleansing. 
So this is one of those instances where the world media, um, it, it, can't, it can't cure cholera, it can't reverse what's happened, but it can use its power and its influence by putting its spotlight on this crisis, which is frankly something that we all want to do as journalists, is, is put a spotlight on hoping to lead towards solutions, or at least dialogue towards trying to find solutions. According to the International Organization for Migration, the Rohingya make up about a million of the 22 and a half million refugees worldwide. And according to the data, almost half of the world's migrants were born in Asia. Primarily, India, China, and Bangladesh, Mexico, and Russia are also large sources of migrants. Where do they go? The IOM says 10 countries host more than half of the world's migrants. Saudi Arabia, Germany, Russia, they each host about 12 million migrants. Almost 9 million are in the UK, and these numbers don't even come close to the nearly 50 million migrants in the United States in 2017. And American has led the International Organization for Migration for most of its 65-year history. But a few weeks ago, the IOM's member states elected Portugal's Antonio Vitorino to lead the organization for the next five years. Ken Isaacs, vice president of the charity Samaritan's Purse, was U.S. President Donald Trump's choice for IOM director general. But the revelation of controversial tweets Isaacs made about Islam and heightened criticism towards the United States over Trump administration policies combined to thwart his candidacy. Full disclosure, Ken Isaacs is a friend of mine, and I publicly said he would be good for the job. I interviewed him recently, right before the IOM election, and we discussed his controversial tweets, the IOM's role in the world, and the United States as a nation of immigrants. From UN data that I have read, there's 47.5 immigrants in the United States. The difference between a migrant and an immigrant, a migrant is the actual physical movement, and immigration is the legal process. So the United States has more immigrants in it than any other country in the world, according to the data that I have read. All right, some places it should be, it's just absolutely atrocious. I read recently about, a, I mean, there have been lots of deaths of migrants in, um, in the Mediterranean, for instance. Mm -hmm. I read the number, I think, this year, 2018, and we're just into June, there's more than 650 who have died in, in trying to migrate, uh, <coughs> to the, and they, they drown in, in the Mediterranean. Does that come under your purview at all, the IOM? Does it have any role in trying to make that safe? Yes, IOM does have a role in trying to help states make migration safe. So, you know, but you, the, the, you bring up a good subject. What would drive somebody to cross the desert and then try to cross the sea in a rubber raft with one or two or 300 other people in it and overcrowded and, and risk their lives? I read somewhere that about one out of every 29 people crossing the Mediterranean die. So w what is so bad at their home? That's a rhetorical question, but it does beg further analysis into what are the drivers of migration. Is it opportunity? Is it security? What is it? And I think that if the world wants to create a safe environment, they need to reduce the drivers of migration so that people don't take risk with their lives. All right, but the IOM doesn't step in until they actually start moving, right? You don't. Does the IOM have any sort of, um, uh, for instance, if sometimes it's environmental in terms of people can't, there's a drought and they can't, they're starving to death, right. or there's war. Um, is, is that something the IOM gets involved in, or does the IOM not get involved until there's movement, until someone elects to, to go and has moved? So this question that you're talking about, like where's the fence around the yard, or what's the division of labor, it, it always moves a little bit because IOM is projectized. And what that means is that their money doesn't come in a big appropriations bucket. Their money comes because they worked with a member state, they identified a need, they wrote a proposal, and they shopped the proposal out and they got funding for it. So that means sometimes they would do things that would look unusual compared to other things that they do. So there's not an exact beginning and ending circumstance. In some situations, IOM would help people as they're actually moving through the desert. They may set up way stations. In other places, I can see IOM be involved in livelihood activities or reintegration programs if people come back to help them settle and uh, pursue a livelihood so that they don't have to leave again so they aren't forced with those kind of hard decisions. What's the story with your tweets because they appear to many people that they're anti-Muslim and a lot of these migrants are Muslims. So I'm not anti anything and what I have learned is maybe what I should have read in your book everything that you needed to know about social media and but trying to communicate a message in 140 characters is not something that I'm skilled at and but if I have told people 
uh, look at my life. My life is an open book. My biography, the stuff that I've done. But is see, that's just it. I mean, the, and all of us who, who know you, I mean, every, um, anybody in sort of the refugee world or the humanitarian world, yeah. everybody knows Ken Isaacs. And so that's why when you read this, because, I mean, you're the real deal in terms of like, go, you're, you were in fact, you were at Cox Bazaar, the Bangladesh refugee camp, long before Nick Kristoff and I were there. Yeah. You, were, you were there first working. And yet these tweets, they just, they don't sound like you to us. Yeah. Well, th th there are uh, things that I shouldn't tread into that um, I treaded into on social media. And there are security dimensions and concerns. And articulating them in 140 characters is not my forte. I won't be doing that anymore. And, um, but again, I just have asked people to judge me on my work. You've been on the humanitarian side, and you say now that, you know, you, that there's a political dimension to this. Um, mm -hmm. But what's been, been the biggest thing that you've learned out of this sort of uh, steeping yourself in this, uh, this job? It, it, it is enormously complex. The issue of migration does not mean to one country what it means to another country. If you go to Bogota, and talk about migration, it means one thing. If you go to Mexico City, it means another thing. What I'm saying is that every country has its own dynamics and its own interest. And, uh, you know, in the United States, when people talk about migration, they tend to think of the wall. But, but it's much more than that. As I said earlier, the United States has 47.5 million immigrants in it. And one thing that all of us have in common is we descended from migrants. All of us, there's no exceptions. And um, uh, if you go to Bangladesh or the Philippines, they each have about 10 million citizens that work abroad, and they send that money back home. This morning I met with a, a, a national leader from El Salvador. He explained to me how important those remittances were to his national economy. So in, in countries like that, what they want is for their citizens to be safe during the migration process. They want them to be able to go abroad and work. They want them to be able to send money back. They probably want to have a reintegration program for them when they come back. And that's very different than a country like Italy, who's going through political turmoil right now. And the, the political rhetoric is deportation and stopping people at sea so they don't get their foot on the land which is not dissimilar to what the United States has done in the past with Haiti. The International Organization for Migration is under the United Nations umbrella with a budget over $1 billion. Marg Bashir is VOA's UN correspondent and she joins us. Nice to see you, Margaret. Thanks, Greta. Margaret, there's a difference, is there not, between a refugee and a migrant? And what is the difference? How is that recognized? So building off of what uh, Ken Isaac said there, a migrant is someone who is moving across borders to work. So it could also, you know, I think people sort of have this image of all migrants coming in dinghies or crossing uh, the southern border of the United States with a backpack. A lot of them are coming in business suits and they're going to Silicon Valley or they're going to London to work in banks. You know, migrants can be anybody crossing a border to take a job. And the majority, the vast majority of the 266 million migrants globally are doing it uh, in a regular fashion, in a legal fashion. They have the visa to work. Uh, so they're doing it in a safe, orderly way, the vast majority. For uh, refugees, there's a legal definition of a refugee, and that's under the Geneva Convention. And it's a person who's fleeing war, persecution, or violence, and they need international protection. All right, tell me, is there, I take it there's more danger, physical danger to people who are refugees because they seem to leave in you know, a quick hurry under horrible conditions. Uh, what about human trafficking and smuggling? Right, so human trafficking has become a, a really big problem, uh, particularly in the last few years, as we see conflicts exploding across the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, much more refugee movement, uh, also much more migrant movement of the irregular variety. And uh, so people are trying to come up through Sub-Saharan Africa to places like Libya, which is in chaos, and then cross into Europe. Uh, a lot of those are Sub-Saharan uh, men coming to migrate to 
to uh, Europe to try and find work. But you also have uh, refugees coming from uh, Syria, from Afghanistan. So they all kind of get muddled together at a certain point, I think, is the problem. Uh, but the smuggling business generates over $7 billion a year, and traffickers are moving over 2 million people uh, each year, over 30 routes across the world. I mean, this isn't just uh, an issue of people in the Mediterranean. It's a, a global issue, and they're moving across multiple routes across the world. And once governments crack down on a route, they find a new route. So it's, it's a kind of an ongoing a problem. All right, well, we see these, these horrible pictures in the, in the, in the people suffering. And um, I want to know, is that with the UN focusing on trying to help these people, or even nations focusing or being host to these people who are coming, is there, is there any effort to sort of look at the, to try to resolve the root cause so that we can sort of diminish the burden on people you know, fleeing? I mean, like, on, are we helping with farming, for instance, in Africa, where there's so much is done by hand? Are we trying to mechanize? Are we trying to go to the root causes? Sure. I think one of the UN's uh, major platforms is prevention, prevention of conflict, prevention of uh, pe people needing to move. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and so uh, there's definitely a lot of international aid coming from many parts of the developed world to the developing world. There's many different programs in place to try and help resolve issues of human rights abuses, of uh, to improve labor markets. There's a youth explosion, Greta, across the world, especially across the developing world. And there needs to be jobs in the home countries for these young people. Otherwise, they are going to migrate. And the developed world recognizes that. And there are definitely programs uh, across many platforms from the United Nations, but also from individual countries. Uh, the United States, uh, through USAID, helps a lot in developing uh, countries. So there need to be uh, job creation, there needs to be job creation, there needs to be uh, an ad addressing these root causes, as you say, to try and stem the need for migration. Margaret, thank you. Joining me to examine migration is Dimitrios Papadimitrio, co-founder of the Migration Policy Institute, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that analyzes the movement of people on Earth. Nice to see you. Very nice to see you. Um, have, the, have the numbers of migration, are they growing in the last 15 years? They are growing, but typically they are growing in line with the growing world population. Earlier on, someone mentioned, probably you did, that there are about 3% of the world's people that are on the move. If you went back 10 or 15 years ago, you would have found essentially the same 2.8, 3, 3.1. So about 3% of the people are moving. Do you find that, I mean, that we're focusing enough, that the world is focusing on enough, that whether it's nations or UN, on going to the root causes? I mean, you see so many disputes, whether it's build the wall or uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel with her. I mean, all over we're talking about it, but it's, this is after people have either left as refugees or migrants. What about uh, the source of the problem, whether it's conflict or, or poverty or climate or starving? We are at a very difficult juncture because unlike crisis in the past, and wars in the past, the crisis that we have been facing in the past 10, 15 years seem to have no end. So that's number one. Number two, yes, people are thinking and talking and spending amazing amounts of money on root causes, development. But there's something funny about putting money on development and aid. For a period of time, sometimes a generation or more, the only thing that they accomplish is generating more interest in migration rather than reducing migration. In, so, in what way? In the, in once people have the knowledge and the means to try to get to a place that they want to go to, they do it. And they do it because they have previous cohorts, you know, their family, their relatives, people from the same village, etc., etc., who did make it over there and succeeded. So they have already created a pathway for them to go. So with development and other forms of aid, we have to pay attention to the following things. First of all is education, particularly education of girls, because that has all sorts of positive effects in terms of uh, reduced fertility, in terms of family formation, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have, as you said earlier, uh, you have to spend money into trying to train people. And of course you have to build infrastructure. 
And you have to have extraordinary patience because if you are spending people's money, if Germany and Sweden and Norway, who put extraordinary proportions of their budget in development aid, if they do so, they have to answer a question that their people might ask, which is, how has that aid reduced unwanted migration? By unwanted migration, I mean illegal immigration. None of this irregular migration sort of uh, talk that we hear everywhere. Refugees, as long as they're coming in an orderly way, they can be managed by the, the rich countries. But people coming in in a very, very irregular, in masses, as far as the eye can see, they create this anxiety on the part of national populations, which then forces their government to actually hold back. I think part of the problem is, I, I mean, just for, even from a selfish point of view, is I don't think citizens in any nation understand that it's in their interest to try to take, take some of the collective money of that nation and try to go to the root cause so that people don't come and then put a burden on their nation. But that's, that's sort of hard to communicate. Um, but one of the things, I was, in, um, I was in Jordan recently where there are a number of refugees who have fled the Syrian war. And the, and the Jordanians have been very welcoming to the Syrians and because of the conflict. But now, now some of the Syrians have come in, at least according to the reports when I was there, and they, they are getting the jobs and they are undercutting the wages of the Jordanians. So the Jordanians, at least the people I talked to, they're getting a little bit raw with the number of people. Their generosity is, is now uh, in, in jeopardy. Right, and competition for resources of all types. Education is a resource. Food. Um, money in order to be able to train yourself, jobs. All of those things, after a while, become, it creates large numbers of newcomers, creates a sense of competition. And resources are always scarce. I don't care how rich you are, you know, you don't have unlimited anything. Germany is spending over 20 billion, 25 in fact, billion euro per year on the newcomers. And they have a five-year plan and they expect to spend that much money each year for the next five years. And that amount is going to be deeply inadequate. Well, it, there's some migrant, migrants you can plan for. I mean, there's plenty. You have with refugees, it's, it's oftentimes catastrophic, sudden, and with, with incredible problems. Like we saw the video of the Rohingya. Um, I mean, these are, this is a catastrophic situation. Uh, absolutely catastrophic, and these people fled with nothing. I mean, mo m most people don't realize that when you're a refugee, you just get up and go. You know, you've, you've watched, you know, you've watched family members perhaps being murdered, your farm has been burned down, your home, you just go. You have no driver's license, no birth certificate. You're a nobody. You're a nobody. You're absolutely right. And um, in order for us to be able to manage not just migration itself, but also how our people feel about migration, we have to meet three tests. Safety, orderliness, and legality. Legality is about choosing the people that will come. You know, these are, it makes no difference whether they're nuclear more scientists. Migrant. That's with that's migrants. Correct. You, you can do that with migrants. That's correct. Because it's not, that's not usually so urgent. The safety part comes, you don't want people to be taking the kinds of chances and put themselves in the, into the hands of all of these traffickers, et cetera, et cetera in order to sort of crash the gates. But, but how do you do that? I mean, I've heard so many stories about in, whether it's a refugee camp or people who are very vulnerable with these migrant situations, which, which resembles sometimes refugees when mm -hmm. they come in, in, in droves, is that you have uh, tr human traffickers, smugglers coming in and they'll say to a family um, who's hungry, who's scared, uh, with no future and say, look, uh, tell your daughter to come with me. I will take her to some big city and she can go to beauty school and she become a beautician or do nails and she'll send the money back. And these people are so desperate, not knowing that that's really not what's happened. That's not going to happen. And that, you know, happens, you know, all too frequently. But all too frequently, people are not as innocent or ignorant as we think we are. In other words, it takes two to tango, even in the smuggling business. So you do have an awful lot of people who fall victims to this kind of a song that somehow everything will be better. But by the time that you reach sort of the final disembarkation point, whether it's Libya, whether it's, you know, the edge of Turkey, whether it is somewhere else, by that time, you're pretty much sure you but, know what's possible or not. Yeah, 
but I, you know, for me, I, say, I, I see most of these people I've ever met, they're desperate. It's not like, you know, it's not like this, you would be talking business yeah. and where you and I could do a business. I mean, we're, we're really talking about a vulnerability and desperation. And, and, and then you combine unexpected factors. I mean, you take the, the Rohingya refugee camp right now. As bad as it was, it really got worse when monsoon season started. You, you didn't think it could get worse, but it got worse. And people grow growing more desperate. And they have nothing to do sitting in these camps. Nothing. And, and we have a responsibility. We people in the West, the wealthier countries, the wealthy countries, to make certain, as much as we can, not that people will not be pushed out of their countries, because that requires a different set of actions, real foreign policy, and things that are really very difficult to do. Sometimes, you know, to intervene, and then outcomes are very uncertain. What we need to do is to make certain that when these people leave their country, and they go to the country adjacent to that, that we actually create conditions for these people to be able to not just survive or subsist, but to somehow begin to thrive. build communities to again, right. to thrive. Well, we, in, in the, in the, I keep going back to the Rohingya refugee camp, is that Bangladesh won't let anyone get any That's education. Exactly. If you can't get any education, because they don't want them to stay there long, so they don't want That's them to correct. set down their roots, so they won't let them develop those things. That's so that correct. But if you put billions of dollars into that effort, yeah. okay, then you can make a difference. And, because and I, Bangladesh wants to have the funds, not just for that, but for other purposes. And, and I don't mean to throw Bangladesh under, under the fire because they have been enormously generous and hospitable under yeah. unthinkable conditions. Um, and they've been very, uh, very gracious in many ways to these refugees. Anyway, Indeed. thank you very much for joining us, sir. My pleasure. Updating a story we have been following regarding a pair of Reuters journalists jailed by Myanmar since December for the reporting about a massacre of Rohingya men. Journalists Wa Lone and Jo So U have now been formally charged with breaching Myanmar's Official Secrets Act when they obtained secret state documents in what a police captain has described as a scheme to trap the reporters. Both journalists pleaded not guilty of the charges telling a judge they were following journalistic ethics U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley called the decision to formally charge these two Reuters journalists as a major setback for press freedom. So far, the Myanmar government has not commented. The next step is a trial before a judge who will deliver a verdict. That trial is expected to last several weeks. That's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice America. And you can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. And follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.